Major breaking news out of the George Floyd Square no-go zone in Minneapolis. During a live report on the anniversary of George Floyd's death, around 30 or so gunshots rang out. People can be seen hitting the floor and ducking for cover. In the report, you hear a man repeatedly saying, get behind the engine block. Now, we don't know if there are any injuries. There's some speculation that two people may have been hurt. Some windows may have been shot out, but it's all relatively preliminary. And we need to wait for the official report so far. Another journalist was recording a stand up at the time, and we have very clear footage of the gunshots that were going off. Police have been called and said the shots were reported from around a block away. So again, this is all happening on the anniversary of George Floyd's death, where there have been several major protests around the country. And there were calls for a moment of silence in Minneapolis at at the George Floyd Square no-go zone. But this is the kind of news that's contributing to a rapid decline in support for Black Lives Matter. I think you may have noticed I call this a no-go zone, and we need to address this and talk about what's going on. Antifa and the far left refer to these areas as autonomous zones. This has been referred to as the George Floyd Square or George Floyd Autonomous Zone, but they absolutely fit the the definition, the colloquial understanding of no-go areas or no-go zones. I think it's important that we don't use the language of those committing these acts of violence and terror when describing what these areas are, because it implies that We agree with them on their terms, what they're doing. Most people do not support this. They don't support the protests. They don't support the riots and they don't support the violence. In a surprising twist, John Brennan has actually come out and and expressed concern over far left vigilantism and the rise of violence, though it's a fairly weak statement. I think we need to go through what's going on and what we can see happening right now. From the White House, of course, they're absolutely supporting the riots As you know, uh, it was Kamala Harris tweeted a fundraiser to bail out many of these writers. And now amid the massive escalation in violence, Jen Psaki for the White House said it's not a crime problem. It's a gun problem, which is just patently untrue. Guns have been around much for, for much, much longer then there has been a massive escalation in crime in these major cities. More importantly, as you may have seen from my previous reports, the crime is occurring mostly in minority neighborhoods. The Black Lives Matter activism is seeing a massive decline in support, lower than where it was last year, dramatically lower than where it was after George Floyd died. And it is the result of violence and riots. And I think most people in these minority neighborhoods know The attacks on police, the calls for defunding the police have contributed contributed significantly to the increase in crime. Now, to be fair, I must point out, crime is rising everywhere, and and the pandemic and the lockdowns may play a role in this. But we cannot ignore that district attorneys in these major cities have released the rioters. So perhaps there is an increase in crime in general, but specific political crime is given a free pass by these leftist DAs. Let's jump into the story about these gunshots ringing out. And I want to go through what's going on with these no-go areas and break down what these are and talk about the importance of identifying these no-go zones for what they are. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com, click the members only button, and you can become a member to support our work and help us do more of what we do, reporting the news. You will also get access to the members area where we have a ton of of segments that YouTube does not allow us to talk about. So there's a lot of content you'll want to check out. And again, in the event we get a strike, we get suspended. We're talking about some very serious things. The mainstream press and the establishment don't like being censored is a very real possibility. I've already seen it on Facebook. So please consider signing up to be a member. Let's get into the news. But don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel and share this video if you really would like to support my work. From Bring Me the News, MN, gunshots ring out during national TV broadcast from George Floyd Square. They report more than a dozen gunshots rang out during a live national news broadcast from George Floyd Square Tuesday after a shooting nearby. Alex Presha, a reporter with ABC News, was speaking live to an anchor from the site at 38th and Chicago on the one year anniversary of Floyd's killing by a then Minneapolis police officer. In the middle of a sentence, The audio captures loud bangs that sound like gunshots and a voice yelling, go, 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 down, 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 as more shots ring out. And here's, they mentioned there's another video from a journalist, Philip Crowther, which I have in a second, an international affiliate reporter from the AP. It shows a dark SUV drive through the intersection, normally closed to traffic, heading south on Chicago Avenue. Pressure tweeted minutes later that they they counted more than a dozen shots. 
Some reports are saying, uh, so as a side, 30 or more shots and rushed behind a row of cars for cover. He and Crowther citing their own counting and others on the scene noted at least a dozen gunshots, possibly more than twice that. One window was reported broken. Minneapolis police in a brief update said gunshots were reported at 10.09 a.m. on the 3800 block of Elliott Avenue South. That's one block east of George Floyd Square. A suspect vehicle was then a suspect vehicle was then seen fleeing the area at a high rate of speed. Shortly after someone arrived at Abbott Northwestern Hospital with a gunshot wound, they were transported to Hennepin County Medical Center and authorities don't believe the wound is life threatening. More information is expected to be released later. An outdoor festival is planned Tuesday at George Floyd Square starting at 1 p.m. Featuring food and live music, a candlelight vigil is then set for 8 p.m. I mean, this is serious stuff. CNN has picked up the reporting reports of gunshots near George Floyd Square on the anniversary of his death. There have been many protests throughout this country. We have seen much. uh, We have seen many George Floyd protests in, in a variety of cities. But I think we need to be serious and, 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 and be real about what's going on, because when you look at this reporting, this is what struck me as frightening and odd. They mentioned an outdoor festival. They refer to this as George Floyd Square. This is not George Floyd Square. This is a no go area. The, the Capitol Hill autonomous zone that many of us made fun of and mocked was still a no go area. Regular people are at great risk entering these places are bar or, or in some cases barred entry to these places. And we cannot use the language of the political extremists. Now, perhaps this is the fault of the media. Perhaps this is the fault of myself and many others. But we have no problem referring to certain areas as no go areas in other countries. But in the US, we use the language of the terrorists. Let me just stress in the Chaz. There were there was a there were there were young people shot and killed in a volley of rapid gunfire. When you talk about the reality of this in a tweet from Philip Crowther, he says, here's the moment shots were fired near George Floyd Square, the no go area earlier this morning. Now, you can't really see anything in the video other than Crowther react and then duck. But I do want to point at a few things with all due respect to Philip for, you know, for, for reporting there. He's reporting for AP GMS. This is, uh, I believe it's the Associated Press for out of Luxembourg. I I respect him for being there and for doing this job. But when you see these shots ring out in this video, he just stands there. There are locals dropping to the ground and crawling for cover to hide. And there are people seen just standing. These people have no business being in this area. This is a dangerous no-go zone. I am not going to, to, to play political games and, and speak the way they want things to be spoken. I'm sorry. These activists are trying to control the narrative. This is, this is, we need to talk about this. A no-go area or no-go zone, according to Wikipedia, is a neighborhood or other geographic area where some or all outsiders either are physically prevented from entering or can enter only at risk. The term includes exclusion zones, which are areas that are officially kept off limits by the government, such as border zones and military exclusion zones. It also includes areas held by violent non-state actors, such as paramilitary, organized crime and terrorist organizations. In some cases, these areas have been held by insurgent organizations attempting to topple government. They say in the 21st century, the term has most often been used to refer to areas that police or medical workers consider too dangerous to enter without heavy backup. Government officials and journalists from various European countries, including France and Germany, have used the term to describe neighborhoods within their own country. This usage of the term is controversial generating significant debate over which areas, if any, are truly off limits to police. Some journalists and politicians have further claimed that Europe and or the United States contain areas where national law has been displaced by Sharia and non-Muslims are shunned. These assertions have been refuted. Well, I'm certainly not talking about areas having to do with Sharia law. I'm talking about areas where you can't actually go in if you don't agree with these political factions and where the police do not enter. Let's break it down. From News Nation Now, NewsGuard certified news source that is a 95 out of 100 credibility says News Nation correspondent confronted, threatened outside George Floyd, quote, autonomous zone. Call it what it is, a no go zone. They won't let journalists in. They have already attacked, according to one reporter, people. I I believe I actually may have the tweet. I'm not sure. Here we go. Philip Crowther reporting. 
George Floyd Square very quiet, but a fellow reporter just had her phone smashed because she took photos of a storefront hit by a bullet. Now, in this story from March 11th, 2021, they say the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Chauvin comes at a time when much of Minneapolis is on edge. It's been called George Floyd Square, a memorial site in South Minneapolis that was created at the corner where George Floyd died. The city eventually replaced, they say community members set up makeshift barricades to block traffic. The city eventually replaced them with concrete barriers. While they have pledged to reopen the intersection following the trial, some activists have taken over the square, declaring it an autonomous zone. It has also been a hotbed for violent crime in recent months, and activists aren't letting police inside. So let me reiterate this for you. Police can't go in. Just like we saw in Seattle, reporters are threatened and physically attacked. No go zone. This is one of the biggest problems we face in this country. Republicans, moderates, disaffected liberals are still reticent to use the language that needs to be used and defer to the language of the extremists. They call it an autonomous zone because they want you to think of it like just a small square where there's you know, where they're in control. And that's it. Whereas no go areas have a more serious and dangerous connotation to them. No go areas have typically referred to wartime locations. But we need to be serious about what this is. 30 or so gunshots reported going out. Someone, someone being brought to the hospital. And we've already seen the op-ed published in the Star Tribune in Minneapolis from locals who say that they need police, that people are on their roofs with guns, that people are shooting up buildings in this area, that cars are being stolen. This, my friends, is a no-go zone. In the story, they say earlier this week on News Nation, uh, on News Nation correspondent Brian Enton went to the outskirts of George Floyd Square, where he was confronted and threatened by two people inside the zone. It's a video that has since gone viral. Now, I want to show you a, 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 an analysis from Ground News, where they say by, what, what Ground News does, they're showing us how many left wing, right wing and centrist outlets reported this? What's the proportion? You can clearly see that only right wing outlets are reporting this. However, the right still refers to these areas using the left's language, ceding that ground to them. Do not do it. These are no go zones. Quote, we tried respectfully to get video, but left after two people confronted us near the barricades. Later learned many protesters don't even feel comfortable there. The residents and activists who serve as unofficial leaders and organizers of George Floyd Square say they won't step aside unless the city meets their list of 24 demands. Among them, recall the county prosecutor, fire the head of the state's criminal investigative agency, and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on programs to create jobs, combat racism, and support affordable housing. This is diversity, inclusivity, equity, cult demands. They come in, they use violence, they shut out the police. And then eventually the police in the cities cave to their demands. We've already seen changes affecting Brooklyn Center, which is a neighborhood suburb north of Minneapolis, basically a part of Minneapolis. It's in the major metro. And they've announced major reforms. They're even going to create unarmed civilian traffic enforcement. They'll be powerless. This is what terrorism looks like. A no-go area where police aren't allowed inside. They're scared to enter. They're terrified. The cops are just absolutely terrified. They're scared. You know, these activists have them worried. The crime has them worried. They won't do it. Many cops have quit. Good for them for doing so instead of serving a corrupt political institution. But the politicians in this city, the city council, they want this. They support it. It will only get worse. They say since the city asserted it would reopen the square after Chauvin's trial, the caretakers of the space have declined to talk in detail about negotiations to reopen it. Janelle Austin, a racial justice leadership coach and lead caretaker of the memorial area, so the demands that fall within the city's control are, aren't unreasonable. However, we can now see that we're way out from the trial of Chauvin and they still have not relinquished control. It still remains extremely violent. Let's talk about, again, another point about no-go zones. They say areas that police or medical workers consider too dangerous to enter. It goes beyond George Floyd Square. You may have seen the story from May 10th. Mother of teen killed in Seattle's autonomous protest zone, Sioux City. I take issue with this. A protest is a demand for change. A protest is people speaking up. But armed individuals patrolling your streets and shutting down certain areas of your city is not a protest. 
It's not an autonomous zone. It is a violent terroristic takeover and the creation of a no-go zone. For those that missed the story, The Hill reports, Danita Sinclair, the mother of Horace Lorenzo Anderson, has filed a federal civil rights lawsuit alleging that the city enabled last summer's CHOP, which led to the death of her 19-year-old son. On June 20th, Anderson was visiting CHOP, the no-go zone, this, and The Hill says the self-declared autonomous zone in which police in which the police cleared the department's east precinct and surrounding areas, according to the Seattle Times, when he ran into another teen identified as Marcel Long, shown on surveillance video and described by witnesses. A scuffle ensued with others pulling the young men apart. Long allegedly then pulled a handgun and shot Anderson several times. Anderson graduated just a day prior to his death from an alternative youth program. On June 8th, the police department withdrew their forces and left behind an east left behind an east precinct on Capitol Hill District. Sinclair alleges in the lawsuit that by allowing police to abandon the area, city officials were negligent and created a situation that led to her son's death. There's also other lawsuits, I believe, in which a young man was killed in a drive by. People were trying to render aid to this individual, but the police could not get in. Paramedics could not get in. These are terroristic no go zones. Mayor Jenny Durgan called the protests a summer of love and a block party last year. Comments that have sim- since come back to bite her. Durkin eventually ended the chop zone with an executive order in July. Up to that point, the protesters successfully seized an approximate six block area and created an autonomous police free zone for several days. The mayor tolerated the behavior while shootings were taking place at chop and some of the protesters decided to protest at her private home. That was kind of the last straw for her. When the, when the Black Lives Matter protesters showed up to her house, that's when the mayor decided that she would shut down this no-go area using police force. Interestingly, it seems like the deaths of these individuals at this uh, no-go area didn't matter to her. And we can see the ramifications of Black Lives Matter. Now, I did cover this recently, but I think the context here is important. The Wall Street Journal reported on the anniversary of George Floyd's killing. Debate about race reaches across American life. They mention in this story that crime is skyrocketing, but it's it's skyrocketing in areas that are predominantly black and Latino. So I think it's fair to say it's clear. Black Lives Matter protests have only caused more problems. Antifa riots have only caused more problems. We've all seen it. We see it getting worse. And now we quite literally have a live news report. When people are calling for a moment of silence, gunshots ring out. These people have only made things substantially worse. Protests have been erupting, of course. This story from PIX11, BLM activists, mayoral candidate Donovan arrested at George Floyd protest near Holland Tunnel. They say several activists and mayoral candidate Sean Donovan were arrested Tuesday morning during a small demonstration in lower Manhattan, marking the anniversary of George Floyd's death. Police placed the activists in plastic zip ties after announcing a warning over the loudspeaker that they would be arrested if they continue to block traffic. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see. This is what is supposed to happen. These activists held up signs demanding justice for George Floyd. To be honest, I'm quite confused by this because the man got his justice. The police are facing federal civil rights uh, uh, charges and Chauvin has been convicted, but they're going to keep protesting because they will never be satisfied. But at the very least, it was a small, peaceful protest. They blocked a road and they got arrested for it. That's what it should be. In the no-go areas, what we get are barricades being set up where armed individuals shoot people. They say a total of five people, one woman and four men were arrested. Police said they were issued summonses for disorderly conduct for blocking traffic to the Holland Tunnel. Javona Newsom spoke with PIX11 Morning News and said she was headed to the protest and reflected on the year since Floyd's death. They say the demonstrators started around 9.30 a.m. at Canal and West Streets. Donovan and Newsom were joined by Reverend Kevin McCall, attorney Stanford Rubenstein, and several other civil rights activists. The group marched a short distance, then knelt on the ground in the middle of the street for nine minutes and 29 seconds. The length of time, we, we understand this, Chauvin was convicted in April of second degree unintentional murder. Now, we, we know this is a problem, and if you've been following my channels, uh, you know this is a serious issue. Surprisingly, on May 22nd, former CIA director John Brennan warns about left-wing rhetoric and Antifa. 
I don't think it's enough, but it's good to see that at least some establishment players are calling this out. Now, I certainly don't trust John Brennan, but the Washington Examiner reports former CIA director John Brennan said he is concerned about the rhetoric coming from some left wing members of Congress as he warned about Antifa's vigilantism. Juliet Kayyem, a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and a former assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security, broached the topic of left wing radicalization in a conversation on Tuesday with the longtime intelligence officer, with the discussion moderator seeking a sense of balance. As she noted, there appears to be a great deal of focus by the FBI on right wing extremism. In response, Brennan acknowledged people who fall under a broad rubric of Antifa while saying politicians should choose their words more carefully, lest they be used by political foes to widen a partisan divide in the United States. Quote, I am concerned about some of this rhetoric that's coming from the left, Brennan said. Again, I think ideologues on both ends of the political spectrum are dangerous, and there are individuals on the left who are engaging in vigilantism themselves that fall under this broad rubric of Antifa, anti-fascist elements. But I do think that ideologues are just blind to reality, and they do not look for ways to allow people from across the political spectrum to live peacefully together. Once again, I can show you the problem with, with the bias track showing 67% of, 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 out of three outlets that reported on this, two of them were conservative. One was leftist, no mainstream outlets talked about Brennan's comments, which means Brennan and many others are getting their information filtered through a biased mainstream media. If you follow only CNN or the New York Times, you are not getting this news. Not even the quotes from the man himself filter back to him in his own, in his own news. As far as he knows, nobody, probably nobody covered this. And therein lies the problem. When he comes out and says, well, look, there are some leftists that are bad. If you actually watched all the news and dug through the bias to find real outlets to figure out what's going on, you would know that Black Lives Matter and Antifa are shooting people, are killing people, are burning down buildings. Of course, you have extremists on the far right. Of course, they're dangerous. Good. The government and law enforcement are going after them. But you are not getting reality from the mainstream media. And John Brennan can speak out against this, but is it really enough? Now, I'll tell you what's remarkable. Even amid all of this, we can see that net support for Black Lives Matter as of the 22nd is at 7%. That's remarkable. Only 7%. That's net support. That's not the majority. That's of all opposition and support. It is only a slight advantage. Now, the reason it's significant is that in the beginning of January, January 2020, it was 10%. That's right. Support for Black Lives Matter has gone down. After George Floyd killed, it was killed, uh, was killed, it spiked, hitting around 24%. But because of the riots, it dropped. After Jacob Blake was shot, it still dropped. And from a high of last year after George Floyd's death of 24% net support, it has fallen to 7%. The crime and violence from these no-go zones, from these political extremists that don't care about the youth, don't care about gun violence, people are seeing it. Not enough people are seeing it. So we need to start talking about this reasonably and honestly. We need to make sure that the people who are opposed to the extremism don't use the language of the extremists. Imagine if conservatives went around talking about the degree of white privilege. No, they reject those ideas. Then don't call it an autonomous zone. Call it a no-go zone. The cops can't go in. People are being killed and you face great personal risk like we saw with that journalist. If you go there, people have been beaten and and, and attacked in these no go zones. That's what they are. Autonomous zone is the choice of words, words used by the left because they know the negative connotations when you say no go zone, which is why it's so controversial to claim they are no go zones because the media will claim you're lying or it's not true or they will use the most extreme interpretation. They'll say there's are- there's areas where the police cannot go, literally cannot go. Well, of course, the cops, if they wanted to, they could walk into George Floyd Square, but they don't because it's dangerous. We know that the police and the paramedics would not go into the Seattle Capitol Hill no no go zone and people died because of it. Now, there's one lawsuit where they're saying that because the cops wouldn't go in and they were outside, that was negligence. They couldn't go in. It was a it was a, a, an autonomous zone. They couldn't get in. It was too dangerous. No, it's a no go area. 
That's why they couldn't get in. And then we have this other story where they say the cops abandoned the precinct. No go zone. Of course, what you're going to hear from the White House will always be deflection. In this story from the New York Post, Jen Psaki says the U.S. has a gun problem, not a crime problem. Well, we learned that in many of these cities that crime is skyrocketing in minority neighborhoods. That's Black Lives Matter's legacy. That's the no-go zones. Guns have been around, very powerful ones, much longer than there has been this escalation in gun violence. I didn't see the White House or Jen Psaki come out and say there's no more gun problem when gun violence was going down. I mean, think about it. Over the past decade or so, gun violence has been on the decline. Major violent crime has been on the decline. They didn't say it's not a, it's not a crime problem. It's that gun problems are going away. No, in fact, they said the problem was still guns. And now that because of their failed policies and because of the election of many progressive district attorneys, you are getting more and more violence. They're saying it's the guns fault. I find that truly remarkable. I have left to say to me that I, I, I will never accept that guns are the, the, the fault for all of this. There's what, 400 million guns? I walk around an area where there's guns everywhere, <laughs> not getting shot. Nobody's getting shot. I walk around. I don't blame uh, cars. I don't say when someone gets into an accident, it's the car's fault. I recognize the car contributed to car accidents. If there were no cars, people couldn't get hit by them. I know. They say, but, but weapons are specifically designed for conflict, for war, to inflict pain or problems. Regardless of that, I understand regular people aren't just trying to hurt random people. But there still is in George Floyd's square no-go zone, people trying to hurt others. It happens in these places because they've removed the police. The New York Post says White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told reporters Monday that the state spate of shootings over the weekend is a gun problem, but that the president is implementing funding for community violence prevention programs to address rising crime. That is the appropriate way to go about doing it. You should not be, uh, you, you shouldn't be uh, blaming guns and banning guns. But I, I do, I do want to, I just noticed I did make a mistake. I had the Wall Street Journal uh, um, stories mixed up. This is a story from the Wall Street Journal. Murders are rising the most in a few isolated precincts of major cities. This is a story about violent crime in minority neighborhoods. I accidentally showed the, the uh, anniversary of the George Floyd protests, which is talking about people protesting. So anyway, I digress. I mixed them up. I just had the Wall Street Journal links, you know, well, I guess to, to clarify, I will, re will read this uh, opening paragraph. The Wall Street Journal reported that a murder wave in U.S. cities that started last year has been concentrated in relatively few poor neighborhoods, typically black and Hispanic, with persistent histories of violence. And I think it's important that I point out that story, too, as I'm reading about Jen Psaki blaming guns for their failed policies, because this is only happening or is mostly happening in minority neighborhoods, which clearly shows there is not a correlation between guns and the violence, because in other areas, wealthier areas, you're not seeing this. But I assure you, rich people have lots of guns. When asked during her daily briefing whether there is a crime problem in this country, Saki answered, I would say certainly there is a gun problem. And that's something the president would say. And there are communities where local violence, community violence is an issue. That's one of the reasons that we have proposed and are now implementing funding for community violence prevention programs across the country. I find it interesting. Uh, is that a racist statement, Jen? Which community, communities are you referring to? Because we can see Wall Street Journal's reporting. We can see the hard numbers. Are you blaming the minorities for the crime in their own neighborhood? It would seem so. And she's blaming guns as well. I will say, Saki added, that we don't often highlight the fact between, that between mass shootings that get a lot of attention, that we lower the flags for there are hundreds, thousands of people who lose their lives. And that's one of the reasons the president will continue to advocate for the Senate passing universal background checks, but also advocate for actions in states where we have seen the greatest level of activism over the past several years. According to CNN, there were 12 mass shootings across America. So I, I don't want to turn this into a video on, on shootings. I just want to point out. We have the White House blaming guns. It's an easy scapegoat. We see them also blaming, uh, they say climate change is the cause of immigration, not their own policies. I'm sorry. It is, it, it is your policies that are doing this. When you allow people to set up no-go zones in Minneapolis, you will get lawlessness. How many more examples do people need? Minority communities suffer with gun violence because the police are being defunded, removed, and because criminals are being released by these DAs. 
in Chaz, how many people died? Four or so people died in the Chaz. In one instance, it was the security guards of the no-go zone shooting and killing two young men in an SUV because they, were th they thought they were white supremacists because they had gone insane. So long as the Democrats allow the formation of no-go zones, it will keep happening. But you know what? As long as people can learn about this and you share stories like this, perhaps support for Black Lives Matter and these extremists will continue to fall. But if people just watch the mainstream news, they won't know this is happening. You guys, you need to inform people. You need to share the stuff. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.